Hi, good morning, and thank you for joining us online here today. Just uh, before we get started, I want to welcome you and say a few things about uh, stuff happening at the church and some upcoming things. Uh, the first one is that uh, this morning we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. So if you want to turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 37 through 47. And then uh, the other thing to share with you is if you've been joining us right when these videos air at 9 a.m., um, next week we're going to move them to 10 a.m. And the reason we're doing this is to prepare for uh, being able to live stream. We're actually hoping next week will be the first week we'll be able to live stream. We'll see what happens with all the tech side of that. We're working on it. Um, but join us either way, it, whether it's recorded or live, we're going to air it at 10 a.m. next week. And that'll be the way that we move forward. So instead of 9 a.m., join us at 10 a.m. online next week. Um, and then uh, the other thing to share with you, two, two more things. First one is the ice cream social that's on August 14th at 6.30. Uh, most of you probably got a flyer in the mail about that. If you're like us, we slapped it on the refrigerator and uh, marked that date on our calendar. But if you missed that or you didn't see it or you know you like to just throw your mail away before you read it, um, go to, uh, you, can, you can save that date, August 14th. Uh, at 6.30, there's going to be an ice cream social. And the point behind this is to say thank you to you, the church body, our church family, for uh, sticking with us and uh, supporting uh, Hilltop during COVID and everything that's gone on. It's just a great way to get together and say thank, thank you. It'll all be outdoors. There'll be social distancing and masks and all the things that we do to remain safe. Um, and I want to see how you eat ice cream through a mask. So that'll be a fun day. Um, and then the last thing to share with you is uh, children's ministry update. Uh, we asked you to be in prayer for us about uh, the hiring process for children's ministry. And uh, we interviewed three different candidates. We really liked all three of them. Um, and uh, it came out that there was a, a great way to use all three of them uh, to help with children's ministry. And so Angel Kennard, who's been with the church for a while, she's going to move into a director position. Um, and uh, Tara Lintz, who's, uh, an, I think I'm saying that with a T and there's not a T, Tara Lintz, um, she's also going to join our staff. If you haven't met Tara yet, uh, you'll get a chance to do that. Uh, she has a background in history with working with other churches uh, within children's ministry. And so she's going to be a great fit for the uh, director's position as well. So you have Angel and Tara on staff. They're going to be working together um, in our Next Gen Ministries to reach students and, uh, and, and uh, have a great children's ministry. Uh, that's what's going to go on with those two. And then Mandy Frost uh, is somebody that we're going to bring in and instead of paying Lifeway for curriculum, we're going to have Mandy Frost write curriculum for us that matches what we're doing on the Sunday service with the adults. So if you bring your kids and uh, or you're watching online and, uh, and you uh, you uh, learn about Acts chapter 2 in the main service, your kids will be learning about Acts chapter 2 as well, but the curriculum is going to be tailored to them for the age group that they're in. So that's a really cool thing uh, that we're going to be able to do in children's ministry. So that's the update on the church. Thanks again for joining us this morning, and I'll talk to you again in just a minute.
Lay 
Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, again, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, verses uh, 37 through 47. And what we're going to see in this passage is gospel responses. We're going to see how people respond to the good news of what Jesus has done. So right before this, a little bit of context, is that Peter has delivered a sermon to a group of, to a large audience of primarily Jewish people that were there for the Feast of Pentecost. And uh, the Spirit of God has, has fallen on the church. The church has started. And then Peter delivers this message of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. And now we get to see how people respond to this news. And um, as I thought about this, I thought about, you know, how do you respond to the news? And if you're like me, you immediately start thinking of the news affiliates that uh, are a part of uh, our, our life in the United States. And um, if you're like me, uh, my typical response to those news outlets is to be suspicious. Um, I, I don't feel like I can trust any of them. Um, and uh, there's actually some song lines, that, a great song that I love um, the salaries are paid by the ads, not the verbs. We're selling the news. The facts are simply one option to choose. We're selling the news. And that's how I feel like when I hear the news. I feel like I'm being sold a point of view that I'm supposed to buy into. Um, and uh, a lot of times the gospel can come across this way as well, that it's this line of news that uh, doesn't really seem quite like it could be real and that we're being sold to it and we have to agree or disagree or whatever it might be. Um, and uh, what we're going to see here is that uh, the, the gospel is not something that's twisted or convoluted. It's not something that somebody's trying to sell to uh, get a, the right point of view across to you um, or their point of view across to you. But instead, this is God's plan for all of humanity, and it always has been. That there would be a group of people, uh, that all people really, would come to a close and intimate relationship with Him, that, they'd be, that they would enjoy His presence and that they would express His life and His love to other people. Um, but as the story of the Bible unfolds, we see that that's not how people responded to God, right? Um, 
that people walked away from God, and that uh, one, of the, one of the claims that Peter makes really clear is that Jesus is the king, that God is intended to be the one who rules over all of our lives and over all of the universe. And what we, what we know is that most people don't approach God in that way. Most people don't, do not approach Jesus in that way. And, there, and all of us know that there was at least one point in time in our life um, where we did not approach Jesus in that way. But what happens at the moment of conversion, at the moment that you understand the gospel and you respond to who Jesus is and what he's done, is that there's a transformation that takes place in our approach to God. And that's what these responses are going to be about, is once we understand who Jesus is, that he is God, that he dealt with our sin once and for all, we know who Jesus is and we know what he did. Um, when that takes place, um, we we, we change ba the way that we live based upon who He is and what He's done. And that's what these responses that we're going to see here are all about. So I'm going to break this up into a couple different sections here. The first one here, uh, just one verse at a time. In verse 37, we see that one of the first responses that people have when they hear the gospel is that they, they gain an awareness of their sin. Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, what Peter had just preached, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Um, and that, that, war, that phrase there, they were pierced to the heart. They knew immediately that based upon what Peter had just expressed, that they had been living in a way, uh, in an approach to God that was not what it should be. And they were immediately saying, we've been approaching Jesus the, the way that we should not have been approaching Him. And so what do we need to do? Um, how, do we, how do we deal with our sin, right? And so that's one of the first things that the gospel will do, is it will create an awareness of sin. In fact, if you, have, you feel that you're a Christian, um, and you responded to the gospel at one point in time in your life, but you were never confronted, about the fact that you had lived a sinful life to that point in time or that, you, that there were tendencies in you, an approach to God that was sinful. If that wasn't dealt with in you, then I would, I would encourage you to reassess uh, whether or not you're a Christian because one of the first things that's always going to happen with the gospel is you will be confronted about the wrong things that you've done and the wrong approach that you have to God. Um, and so that, that's a big thing to just take a hold of. If, 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 if my conversion story is one of I prayed a prayer and I did this one religious thing this one time and my life doesn't look any different than it did previously, um, I keep doing the same things and I still approach God as though He were subservient to me, um, uh, that's not, that doesn't match what the gospel says that uh, should happen. Instead, what we see is in verse 38 that the, the, the next thing, the next response that we see from these people is they repent and they commit. Peter said to them, Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the first thing that happens is they repent and they commit. Uh, repent, uh, the Greek word is metanoia, it's change of mind. That I had, I had a mindset previously where I approached God and he, he needed to do what I wanted Him to do. Or He didn't exist at all, right? Uh, the, the, there's, there's, there's the idea that maybe there is no throne room, that there is no king, that there is no God that rules this universe, and that uh, He doesn't exist in the first place. So that would be a change of mind that would have to take place that He does exist, uh, that He is in control, that, uh, that He does have a throne, and that He does rule, and He does reign. And then the next thing that we'd have to deal with is that in my approach to Him, to this point I've approached them, Him as though He should do what I said. In fact, I understand that there's a throne room of the universe, or maybe just my life, that there's, a direct, there's one who sets the direction of my life, and to this point it's been me. Um, and I want to continue to do that. And we'd have to repent from that state of mind and stay, instead of me being the one who determines the direction of my life, I'm going to allow God to be the one to determine the direction of my life. I repent from telling Him how things ought to be, and instead I give Him His rightful place as God. I'm going to repent from that. Right to 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 want to be to say that I should be on the throne of, of my own life instead of God is a state of rebellion. I'm king, not you. And one of the first things that has to take place is we have to repent from that mindset. And then the next thing is that there's this public commitment. That's what baptism is in part. That's what it's about. It's a public statement of I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I am committing myself to Him. In the same way that a marriage ceremony would commit me to my bride, my wife, right? That ceremony that we had actually on this stage 
16 years ago, uh, was, was a moment where we said to each other in front of a whole bunch of people that we are committed to each other and we are going to stay together until death do us part. And baptism, in a similar way, is that same type of covenant agreement of saying, I am committed to my relationship with God through, his, through the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son, Jesus. I trust that I can be close to Him because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has done. And it's a public commitment of I belong to Him. And my, my relationship with Him is one where He calls the shots and I am His servant and I trust Him because I know His goodness and I know His love, right? So that's one of the first things that we see here is this repentance and commitment. And when this takes place, when a person does this, when a person agrees to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and they submit to His lead and His rule and they, they trust Him because of His goodness, uh, what happens when that moment of belief takes place is we actually receive God's presence. It says in, at the end of verse 38, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is huge, right? Because uh, it's no longer my abilities that are going to determine the success and outcome of my life and my relationship with God. But instead, not only is He going to make the way for me to have relationship with Him, but He's going to empower me to live with Him in a way that honors Him and seeks His glory. That's what the Spirit of God is going to do in me. He's going to cause me to live in a new way in a relationship with God that I'd never lived like before. I'd never had this relationship with God before. I never, I never walked around the earth with His presence with me everywhere that I went before. I never, I never had His voice in my heart and in my ear guiding me to make decisions that match His will that He's revealed to me through His scriptures. I've never lived like this before, but now I can because He indwells me and everywhere that I go, the Spirit of God is with me, which actually rolls right into the next point, right? So the next point is that when we have this, one of the responses that we have to what God has done is that we're going to be saved, uh, which means to be removed from a situation of danger and brought into a situation of security and that we're going to be different, okay? And so he says this next, for the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call to Himself. So there's an aspect of family going on here, being saved. Um, and with many other words, He solemnly testified and kept exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And so what they're doing here is they're being saved. They're being drawn out of a situation of danger and being brought into a situation of security. They're being brought out of a situation where they're controlled, right? One of the, one of the truths that comes out in Paul's writings really clearly is that we were once slaves to sin, that we were literally enslaved to having to live to a way that did not honor God. As rebels, we had actually given ourselves over to a different master, and this master always led us in a direction that did not match God's. Okay, And what the gospel does is it actually draws us out of that enslavement to sin and to a master that would lead us away from God and brings us into God's family and makes us His children. So we go from being in this situation of danger and harm and we are brought into this situation of security and family as God has saved us from that. Now, once we're there, he says, be saved from this perverse generation. That word perverse could be crooked. Uh, it has the idea of rebellion. Be saved from this generation that does not recognize God as God, that does not recognize that through, uh, through Jesus Christ, the Messiah has come, uh, the Savior of all of us has shown up, and He's paid the debt that we owed. He's dealt with our sin, and He's purchased us out of slavery and made us His children. Uh, don't, don't be saved from, from the mindset, from a group of people who would not recognize that that's who God is. And so uh, part of this is we're, we're saved and then we're different right? Uh, God calls us to be a peculiar people. Um, he calls us to be called out from among, the, from, among, um, out from among the nations and to live in a different way, right? And this is a huge part of what it is to be a Christian. And again, this is where if you, if you say, hey, I'm a Christian, but my life looks just like it did before, or it looks just like everybody around me, um, there, there's, a, there's a heart check that needs to go on in that because God's called us out of that to be different. He's drawn us into a new relationship with Him where we live His ways. We live out this relationship with Him and He causes us to, to love Him and to love other people. He causes us to walk in His standards. He causes us to, to, to enjoy living in His standards, to recognize that what He says about life is best and want it, right? He calls us and gives us that new heart, that new set of desires. 
He saves us from a generation that would not recognize him as such. Okay? And then the next thing that he has us do is he has us, uh, um, and the next, one of the next set of responses we see here is to participate and proclaim. It says this here, so, so those who, excuse me, so then those who had received the word were baptized. So those who received, who they, they, they didn't just hear it with their ears, but they brought it into their hearts. They agreed with and came into a place where they say, yes, this is true, this is right. I'm going to receive this word, this truth about who Jesus is, this news of who God is and what he's done. I'm going to receive it and I'm going to make it a part of who I am, right? A lot of times when I hear the news, I look at it and I go, I'm not going to receive that and I'm not going to make it a part of who I am and I'm not going to live my life based upon what they just said on the news channel, right? And, and we can do that with the gospel. We can hear it, but not receive it. We can say, no, I'm not going to live according to that. Uh, that's not going to uh, make its way into my heart and into my mind and then make its way out into my life. I'm not allowing it to do that. But these people do. They receive the word. It made it into their heart. It made it into their mind, and they were going to live differently because of it. Um, they're they're uh, they're, they're participating in what this truth is by being baptized. And it said that 3,000 were added to, uh, about 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. Uh, there's some imagery between uh, what took place at the giving of the law and 3,000 people dying. And here is the giving of the Spirit and three people coming to life that the law could never bring the life uh, that people wanted to have, that God longed for us to have. But instead it was given to show us our need of a Savior. And now that the Savior has come and the Spirit indwells us, uh, the Spirit can do what the law never could and give us this kind of life. Uh, 3,000 souls being added. But what they're doing is they're participating and proclaiming. This is another part of what baptism is, is it's this proclamation. It's this statement of this is who God is and this is what He's done. And I'm, I'm participating and taking in His life. I'm receiving the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And I'm not just uh, kind of throwing it out throwing out the newspaper and never allowing it to make its way into my heart and my mind, which sometimes that's the best thing to do with the news. But that's not the best thing to do with this news. The best thing to do with the news of who Jesus is is to allow it to transform my heart, transform my mind, change the way that I live, and participate and proclaim the awesomeness of who God is. Okay, one of the, the next response we see here in verse 42 is that we grow in God's heart and in His ways. Let me read this verse. Uh, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. So they're growing in God's heart and in His ways. This is an ongoing thing where they're saying this is what God's heart is. This is what His desires are. We're going to grow in having our heart match God's heart as we understand His desires and, and allow them to transform ours. And we're going to grow in His ways. And they do this in a couple of different ways. The first one is, is that they, they, they engage in the apostles' teaching. And actually, uh, as we look at this, this is a really interesting thing to look at and go, okay, this is what the early church was all about. What should I be lo looking for in a local church um, that I want to be a part of? Uh, and, and I think there's some really good answers here. The first one that we see is that they're, they, they are looking into, they are agreeing with, and constantly devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. And so we have here that one of the things that the local church should do is provide theology and doctrine, that it should be able to draw out of the Scriptures uh, through the apostles' teaching and through what, uh, what Jesus Christ has done and then what His apostles laid out for us. We should be able to say, hey, this is the truth about theology. This is the truth about who God is and what He's done. Um, and then it should be able to lay out doctrine for us. This is what is true in life, and this is what is not true in life. Okay, And so that's one of the things that a local church should do, is provide theology and doctrine. The next thing is that there's, there's fellowship. They're devoting themselves uh, to the apostles' teaching and to Fellowship. Uh, this is a strong Christian community that comes together to serve each other, to, uh, to meet the needs of each other. We're going to see how they do this a little bit more in a second. But there's this strong Christian community that is drawn together to love each other and care for each other. Uh, you might view this as a church that says, hey, we're a missional community that welcomes anyone. We are this group of believers and we're drawn together to look out for each other, but also to be on this mission that God has given us. And different churches will focus on different things. Uh, so this is an interesting thing to look at. 
The next one here is that uh, in verse 42 it says the breaking of bread and prayer. And these are both acts of wor worship. And so you might go to a church where it's all about the worship. Uh, we're, we're a church where you can experience the presence of God through meaningful worship, right? Uh, and there are churches that that's what they're all about. It's all about the worship. Um, and then actually if we go on to some of the other verses, we see in verse 45... Uh, using property and possessions for the common good of others. This is outreach. We're a church that meets the needs of our community. We're all about meeting the needs of our community and doing these things for other people. Uh, verse 46 says, Day by day they were continuing with one mind in the temple. Uh, we're a church that's all about unity and intellect. We're well organized and unified around a cohesive vision. That's what we're all about. Um, verse 47 says, The Lord was adding to their number daily. This is evangelism. We're a church that reaches the lost and invites the Holy Spirit to use us to win souls. That's what we're all about. And one of the things that we've seen take place um, in our consumeristic society is that there are people that will look at things like this and they'll go, Well, my favorite one on there is worship, so I'm going to find a church that's all about worship. Or my favorite one on there is evangelism, so I'm going to find a church that's all about evangelism. Or my favorite thing on there is community outreach and meeting the needs of people, so I'm going to find a church that really focuses on that. Or I really need fellowship. I need this strong Christian community where I can look out for others and they can look out for me, so I'm going to find a church that's all about that. Um, I, I'm all about the apostles' teaching, so for me it's all about theology and doctrine and knowing the right stuff. Um, and what we do with this is much like what we do with uh, like sports clothing. We go, well, I like Adidas the best, or I like Under Armour the best, or I like Nike the best, or I like that new startup brand that's on Instagram the best, or I like this other one the best. And, and our consumeristic man mentality, we go, I like this one the best, and so I'm only going to go after that one. And the really scary thing is that churches have bought into this, and they've said, well, well since we, we're... The group of people out there, the Christians are looking for uh, to consume this one thing. We're just going to focus on that one thing. And actually, I think what we see here with the early church and the reason that they grew so much is that a really great spirit-filled church does all of these things. A really great spirit-filled church does all all of these things. They, they, they teach good doctrine and theology. They, they teach you the right thing about who God is and what, he's, what His ways are. Uh, they build a place where there's fellowship and strong community where Christians look out for each other. And they, they worship God through the breaking of bread and prayer and song. And they do these things where uh, it's meaningful experience of meeting God through worship. Um, they use properties and possessions for the common good. They, they're a group of people that understands that what God has given me isn't mine for the sake of how much I can acquire, but God's given it to me so that I could bless other people, and so I want to use it that way. And they're filled with believers that are generous, churches that, that preach generosity, teach generosity, and are filled with people who are generous. Um, they, they, they have a cohesive vision, and they have an idea of where they're going and what they're doing, and it matches all of these other things. And they care about evangelism. They care about reaching the lost, and they care about uh, people coming into the family of God who are not a part of it now. And so I think the danger that we can have as, as a church and the danger that you can have as a Christian is saying, well, I like this one the best, so I'm going to focus on it, and the other ones can go the wayside. Or I'm not really good at this other one, so I'm just going to avoid it altogether. And and what we see here is that a spirit-filled church will be able to do all of these things. And it will require the whole body of Christ to do these. No one person is going to be great at all of this. But instead, it will be a body of believers that are brought together to, for this whole purpose of uh, growing in God's heart and growing in His ways, having a heart and a set of desires that matches His in knowing Him, in having relationship with Him, in loving fellow Christians and reaching out to those around us with the gospel um, and, and enjoying this amazing worship experience that we can have where we can meet God um, together uh, in, in prayer and in song and breaking of bread um, and, and, and that love that we have for Him. Last response here is to be a hot spot of God's presence. Uh, verses 43 through 47 say this, Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Praising God 
And having favor with all the people, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so what we see here is this is, this is what it looks like to be a hot spot of God's presence. And so you think about what, what's a hot spot and immediately like maybe the imagery for you is, is Wi-Fi. Um, and if you've ever been on the road and you've got your phone with you and maybe you wanted to download a set of songs before you left home but you forgot to and you don't want to burn through all your data, you're, you're looking around and you're like, where can I get, where can I get good Wi-Fi? Uh, where can I go? And you see a Starbucks and you're like, oh, pull into the parking lot, log on to the Starbucks uh, Wi-Fi and, uh, and then download whatever it is you're downloading. I actually had this happen. Um, I, was, I was driving around and I needed to send an email uh, and I had to attach a big file from, uh, from uh, a source and so I had to get out Wi-Fi. So I stopped at Starbucks, hopped on the Wi-Fi hotspot, pulled up the computer, attached the file to the email and, and sent it off. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, um, that's what people viewed relationship with God like, that you had to get to a hot spot to have it. Um, that the only place that these hot spots existed was that you could go to the temple, and that was the hot spot of God's presence. Uh, it was either the tabernacle before the temple existed, that was the hot spot of God's presence, or you could go to the temple. Uh, prior to all of sin being taken place, it was viewed that the whole earth was God's hot spot, um, and that the Garden of Eden was the place that He had placed Adam and Eve, and that His presence was with them all of the time. And then sin breaks it, and then uh, God's presence is, is somewhere what confined in our, in our minds and in our imagery to a place, um, a specific place, either the tabernacle or the temple. And actually, if you look at the way that the tabernacle and the temple were all set up, it had to do with it being a place of holiness that was uh, free from sin where God and people could come together. And then what happens with Jesus, His death, burial, and resurrection is sin is dealt with once and for all. And you don't have to go to a building for this place of of holiness to exist where you can meet God, but instead uh, he's actually cleaned up my human heart. He's actually transformed it. He's caused me to be a new creation, a different being than I've ever been before. And I, as I have relationship with, uh, with God through Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I become the hot spot. And everywhere that I go, everywhere that you go as a Christian becomes a hot spot of God's presence. Now, like people are looking for good Wi-Fi to uh, download songs, even more than that, people are looking for the power and presence of God in their lives. They may not be able to identify that that's what they're looking for, but everyone is looking for this relationship with God. And what God has done through the church, what He's done through uh, indwelling individual believers, is He's allowed us everywhere that we go to be a hot spot of His presence, to be that place where people can meet and interact with someone who uh, um, is a temple of the living God, right? And, and that's what we can be everywhere that we go. That's what God has called the church to be, is this hot spot of God's presence where we're abiding in Him, we're connected to Him, and we're allowing the Spirit of God to live His life out and through us wherever it is that we go. Now, he defines what some of this hot spot will look like, that there's a sense of awe at the many signs and wonders that were taking place through the apostles. At this point in time, the apostles were performing miracles to confirm uh, that Jesus truly was who he said he was um, and that he really did what they're saying that he did. And so their miracles affirm them as messengers. Um, and what, what we now experience is this sense of awe that everywhere that I go, God is with me. Uh, honestly, that in and of itself truly is a miracle. The fact that everywhere that I go, God is with me. The miracle of my life is that God has transformed my heart and He's changed my mind and He's caused me to live in a way that I could have never lived before Him. Uh, the, the miracle of my life is that I have close and meaningful relationship with God through what Jesus Christ has done. I am in awe that He has done that. If you ever lose a sense of awe about the good news of who Jesus is and what He's done, uh, your eyes are probably fixed on something else because it is amazing what Jesus has done. And we can share that sense of amazement, one, with each other as Christians, and two, with the world around us everywhere that we go. Uh, one of the other things that being a hotspot looks like, uh, this is really interesting in 40 and 45, he talks about uh, they, they, they took their possessions and any time that there was somebody in need, they would sell a possession and meet that need of somebody else. Now, what this isn't is it isn't Marxism. Uh, this isn't everyone sold all their stuff to the apostles. Uh, they went and 
took all their money and gave it to the apostles, and then the apostles gave out a check um, uh, to everybody that evened the playing field. That's not what's taking place here. This isn't that. What it is, is it's people who have come together and they realize that God has maybe blessed me with more than he's blessed you with, and you're in need, so I can take some of what he's given me and give it to you for your betterment. That's what is going on here. Um, and God will cause people who are in relationship with him. What, one of the things that, that a hot spot of God will be marked by is generosity. Not, not, not people who have to have and hold and won't give, but one of the true marks of being a hot spot of God is generosity. Um, and so as you look at this, you might think, okay, uh, I'm not great at generosity. Um, and, and growing up in a uh, consumeristic society where it's all about what I can get, many of us have not been taught generosity. But the gospel will teach you. The good news of who Jesus is will teach you generosity. And this is one simple way that you can understand how the gospel has taught you generosity. Um, the God of the universe took all of his glory and all of his blessings, and he became a human. Uh, he took everything that he had and he laid it aside and then he used it actually to give to you life and forgiveness of sins. He purchased for you what was well out of the range that you could purchase. Um, you know, you, when, if you're looking for a car and you're like, well, I got a couple thousand dollars, uh, I'm on the car lot, I got a couple grand and I can buy a used beater. Uh, what, what God does is He says, no, no, we're going to get you the brand new setup. We're not going to transform the beat up car that you are, but I'm going to make you somebody brand new. And that's what the gospel does for us. That's just one mark of the generosity that the gospel has shown us, that God has given us. And that, that generosity should show up in us. Um, one of the next things that we see in, uh, in being a hotspot of God, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread house to house, they were taking meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. Uh, so we see that one of the things that is marked by being a hotspot of God is that uh, relationship with Him is central. Uh, you don't do this day by day with one mind meeting with other fellow believers and joining together and celebrating Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection through communion and taking meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, recognizing that what you have is given to you by God. Uh, this is the, the relationship with God is central to everything that you do. And that's what we see with these people is that their relationship with God is central to what they do. They're continuing day by day to meet with each other, to go over the apostles' teaching, to break bread together, to celebrate what Jesus has done. Um, and, and this is an area of our lives where there's just this constant day-by-day -day presence of God is central to everything that I do. And they're praising God having favor with all people. People look at the way that Christians are living their lives here in the early church and they go, wow, that's what life is supposed to look like. There's supposed to be a sense of awe. There's supposed to be a sense of enjoyment. I, I, was, I was supposed to have a relationship with my Creator, and, and we can through what Jesus Christ has done. And, and I'm supposed to just be this place where generosity exists and love for other people flows out of me. And when that happens, it says, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so what we get in this picture of what these gospel responses create is when we, when we, when we have an awareness of sin, right? Go back through these really quick. When we have an awareness of our sin and we recognize that we need transformation, and you see people repent and commit their lives to relationship with Jesus Christ. And then they receive God's power and God's presence is with them everywhere that they go. And they're called out and they're saved and they're different and they live a life that doesn't match the life that they lived before. And they participate in the gospel and they proclaim who Jesus is to the world around them. Um, and then they're, they're growing in God's heart and they're growing in God's ways. They become this hot spot of God's presence. And the end result is a growing family of God. The end result is there in verse 47, and God was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. When authentic, genuine Christianity takes place, when people say, I lived a life that didn't recognize God as God and I'm not going to live that way anymore. I'm going to repent from that and I'm going to commit to a new relationship with God. I'm going to walk by God's presence and I'm going to be different and I'm going to be saved from the way that I used to live and I'm going to live a new way and I'm going to uh, proclaim who Jesus is and what He's done and I'm going I'm to grow in His heart and in His ways and I'm going to 
I'm going to be a hot spot of His presence. I'm going to be marked by a sense of awe of what God has done and generosity to other people and fellowship with other believers. And my life revolves around my relationship with God. When that takes place, the church grows. Um, people see it and they go, that's, that's something that I want. That's what, I don't know what it is, but that must be what relationship with Jesus is all about. And, and, and I think one of the things that we have to draw out of this passage is that's what a holistic New Testament church does. It does all of those things. Not one or two of them and neglect the others, but it does all of those things. And it has a mindset of drawing people into relationship with God because it's so great to be in relationship with Him. So I don't know where you're at this week or what you have going on. I know we're all knee deep in COVID and uh, uh, political news and all the different things that are going on. And there's so many things to distract us. And what I want to remind you of right now is make what, who Jesus is, the good news of who Jesus is and what Jesus done, continue to make that central to who you are and the way that you're living. Uh, don't allow the other things around you to be the central thing that you focus on, but remember who Jesus is and what he's done, this news that is truly worth proclaiming, and live out this kind of relationship with him. That's my prayer for you this week. Um, and uh, we're going to take communion uh, together Sunday morning when this takes place. Uh, this is Friday right now, and I'm filming. But Sunday when this happens, we're going to take communion together. And so I encourage you as a family to maybe get, 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 get some stuff for communion, get the grape juice, um, uh, get, the, get the bread, and take communion together as a family and celebrate. Remember and celebrate Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, and that he truly is God. And because of his death, burial, and resurrection, you are a new person. Uh, join together with your family this week and celebrate that in communion. The other thing I want to remind you of is that uh, Children's Ministry has some really awesome videos going on right now. Um, I know because my, my kids were part of filming it this week, and uh, you'll get a laugh out of it this week. Um, we encourage you to sit down with your kids and watch that video. It's a much shorter version of what I just said. Um, and uh, you can get that together with your, with your kids and uh, check those out. Those videos are really good. Anyway, have a great day. Let me pray. Lord God, thank you for... Uh, our time together in your word. Uh, thank you that we can meet virtually, um, though in person would be so much better, but we thank you that you've given us means to, uh, to continue in the apostles' teaching, to grow in our understanding of uh, those who knew you and walked with you on a personal level here while you were on earth. Um, you use them to then spread the good news of who you are and what you did. Uh, I, I am a benefactor of what they have done. Um, and many, many faithful Christians before me who have carried this message forward through the centuries. And God, we want to be right now, right here, people who continue to carry this message forward. We want to be people who have repented of our old way of life, that we were aware that sin had held us down and caused us to uh, just be stuck, enslaved is the language that you used. And you freed us from those bounds. Um, you've saved us from that and you've given us new life. And God, we want to grow in your heart and in your ways and we want to continue to have our lives match who you are through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit living out of us. And God, may we continue to have a sense of awe about who you are and what you've done, this news that the Lord God of all the universe gave his life to pay my debt so that I could be back in relationship with him. It's unreal. Um, and not only did you pay that debt, uh, but, you, but you made me new. Um, what, an awe, what, a, what a thing to just continue to be in awe about. Um, and God, may you, may you stir us to be generous this week, maybe in a way that we've never been generous before. Uh, may you cause us, those, who, those of us who have uh, much, and that's most of us, those of us who have much, will you, will you show us a new way to be generous this week, to give to those who are in need. Um, and may you be central to our lives day by day um, with one mind, spending time uh, together enjoying your presence and remembering what you've done, having gladness and um, an enjoyment about who you are and what you've done. And we praise you, God, for all that you've done. And we want to be a part of you uh, adding to the number of people who are saved, the number of people who hear the good news and have the opportunity to respond to it and by your spirit are empowered to do so. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Kids, today we'll be learning about agility. Oh. Kids, take oh. over. <laughs> they said to Peter and the other apostles, "Brothers, what should we do?" Peter replied, "All you must turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then your sins will be forgiven." Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 people joined the believers that day. They shared their lives together. They ate and prayed together. They shared everything they had. They sold property and other things they owned. They gave to anyone who needed something. Every day they met together in the temple courtyard. They ate meals together in their homes. Their hearts were glad and sincere. They praised God. They were respected by all the people. Every day, the Lord added to their group. So, baptism, is that when like, you get in the water and for some reason you're with God? No. What is it then? It's the biblical inside out. Showing what God, showing on the outside what God did on the inside. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Fellowship, like Fellowship of the Rings. I love that movie. Like, um, no, actually, this fellowship is like 
where Christians get together and they like they encourage each other and they talk to each other in a nice way. Water from one bucket into another using a sponge. Let's play! 